Alright, we're here in Genesis chapter 6, and this is going to be a three-part series on the flood. And when you look at the Bible, it's kind of interesting because the first 25% of human history is only like the first like nine chapters of the Bible. You know, once the flood comes, this is the sixth chapter of the Bible here, and it lasts for a few chapters. They talk about the flood. That's about 25% of human history because the earth is around, you know, a little bit more than 6,000 years old. And that's, that's a long time period that goes by, and the Bible does not say a whole lot about it. And when you stop and think about what would cause God to flood the entire world, okay? Because you look at the world we live in today. Is it a righteous world that we live in? No. no. I mean, is the Philippines a righteous place? Are, are countries around the world righteous? They're not righteous. But obviously what happened in Genesis chapter 6 was so bad that God decided he would destroy the world. And you know, sometimes we can just kind of quickly read over this and not really stop to think about what exactly was taking place. But we might try to guess about it. But honestly, you don't have to guess because the Bible is actually very specific with what was taking place. The reason why people don't realize that is because the God is always discreet, okay? God is not graphic in his descriptions of what is taking place. You know, sometimes you see people on Facebook, you know, they're kind of a little bit overzealous. And they'll post like two pictures of, you know, guys kissing and say, isn't this gross? And it's like, yeah, that is gross. That's why I don't really appreciate you putting on your Facebook for everybody to see. Because in the Bible, God is discreet. He doesn't go into detail about things like this that take place. But actually in the Bible, you're going to see that God's very specific with what was taking place if you stop and closely look at what he says. But let's see what the start of this was. Look at Genesis chapter 6. Let's look at verse number 1. And we'll see the start of what ended up causing the destruction. It says in verse number one, And it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, a lot of people have different ideas on what are the sons of God, but if you just read through the Bible, it's kind of obvious who the sons of God are. I'm a son of God. Amen. You're a son of God if you believe Amen. on Jesus Christ. Amen. You're a child of God. Behold what manner of love he hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Now, people have a weird idea this is talking about fallen angels, but that is not what the Bible talks about. The Bible always says believers are sons of God. And here's what you have to understand. Why is God mad at the world? Is he mad at angels or man? He's mad at man in Genesis chapter 6. He floods the world because he's mad at men. He wasn't mad at angels. If this was the fault of the angels, he'd be blaming them. Judgment would come upon them. But he judges men because men chose to be wicked. So what does it mean when it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men? It means believers married unbelievers. That's all it's saying. The sons of God. They didn't marry daughters of God. They married daughters of men. Why did they do that? That they were fair. They found them attractive. That is a foolish reason to get married. Simply because you find them attractive. Now, I do believe that the person you marry, you ought to be attracted to. I think it's, it's ridiculous if you don't find the person you're married attractive. I have a friend of mine who graduated from Hiles Anderson College, and there was this guy who was teaching on marriage. And he was in front of the class, and he brought up his wife. And this, this, is, this is no lie. This is exactly what he said, at least according to what my friend said. He said that, you know, I do not find my wife attractive. That's what he said in front of everyone. But she's the godliest person I know. It's like, what an idiot you are. I don't care how long you've been married. You need to take some marriage counseling from, you know, whomever. It's like, why would you say that? And, and, and that's foolish, though. I mean, to not be attracted to the person you're married to. That Obviously, the number one reason should not be due to looks. But it's kind of foolish to just say, wow, well, you know, that doesn't matter at all. Obviously, you're going to be attracted to the person that you marry. But that shouldn't be the main reason why you marry them. And that is the main reason here in Genesis chapter 6 why they get married to them. Turn to 2 Corinthians 6. And so when it comes to marrying someone, this is not really one of the points. This is kind of an introduction of what caused the destruction. Obviously, you should marry someone who's saved first of all. Okay. Uh, Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? So the Bible says you're not to be yoked with unbelievers. But even more so, at our church, we believe some unique doctrines and some unique things. And we believe in soul winning and hard preaching. That is not something that most people believe in. Look, you would be wise to those that are not married in this room 
find someone who likes this kind of preaching. Because uh, yeah. the truth is that most people would not like the words that come no. out of my mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Right? They wouldn't like this sort of preaching. They wouldn't like this sort of church. Marry someone who actually likes the preaching of the word of God. Marry someone who also loves soul winning like you love soul winning. Look, if they don't love soul winning now, they're not going to love soul winning once you get married. No. Yeah. Right. And it's going to get worse once you raise your kids and you're always fighting about everything. So not just marrying someone who's saved, but marry someone who actually loves the Lord and has the same beliefs and has the same goals as you have. Now, obviously, you might marry someone who's not as far on that path of living for God. It takes time to grow. We understand that. Be patient. You know, they don't have to be at the same level you are, but marry someone who wants to climb upwards and says, you know what, I want to make the changes in my life. Maybe I'm not there right now, but I want to make those changes. Don't be foolish and marry someone who doesn't want to do that. And just thinking from a practical level, if you would compromise on who you marry right now, you're going to compromise on everything right. once you actually get married. Right. If you're willing to compromise on whether or not your spouse is saved, whether or not they want to live for the Lord, whether or not you're going to have them baptized in the Catholic Church, whether or not you're going to grow them up as a Baptist, you're going to compromise on everything. Yep. You're going to compromise on all those things if you compromise on who you get married. There's some things you have to take a stand for. Now, another thing to keep in mind is this, that if, 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 if you don't have the guts to bring up salvation before you're married, you're probably not going to have the guts to bring it up afterwards. No, I right. know people that I used to go to church with that married unbelievers and their spouse is still unmarried, and they're still waiting for the right time to preach the gospel to them. <laughs> it's like, man, that time was before you started dating them, and certainly before you got married. But see, that is the start of the downward spiral of man in Genesis chapter 6. It starts because believers chose to marry unbelievers. And if believers are going to marry unbelievers, what's going to end up happening? None of those families are going to live for God. That's just the way it is. Now turn back to Genesis 6. Now let me say this, that obviously if you're married, and we're going to talk about this later, but whoever you're married to is the person that, we're actually going to talk about that in the next sermon. You know, it's a different sermon series. But whoever you're married to is who God wants you to be married to. You know, if you're married, that's a bond you've made, you know, for better or worse, till death do us part. In sickness and health, till death do us part. You've made a vow before God that you will stay married to them. So whether or not you fight, you stay married. And that's why it's right. foolish even to, to make comments like, oh, let's get a divorce, blah, blah, or whatever. That's foolish. Now, obviously here in the Philippines, you know, it's illegal to get a divorce, but a lot of people get married and they choose to just separate. Even if they're not legally divorced, they're still acting as a divorced couple. Right, right. And so obviously, you know, once you're married, you stay married. But that's the start of the downward spiral of man. But let's look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And it said, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay? So notice how it says every imagination. The first point we have is this. God destroyed the world due to wicked imaginations. Basically, a wicked mind and a wicked heart. And look at Genesis 11. Turn there. And it's a strong statement when he says every imagination. Okay, not just some imaginations. We all think foolish thoughts from time to time, but the Bible is very clear in Genesis 6. Every imagination, okay? Right. Notice Genesis chapter 11, verse 6. We're going to see this word imagine again. It says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now this is after the flood. And once again, they're becoming wicked again. They're building up a tower to reach up to God. And God, at this point, destroys the languages. He makes it so people speak different languages, so they can't communicate with one another. Because he says this, they've imagined to do this, and he says nothing is going to be restrained from them. So he said the only way to stop them is to prevent them from being able to communicate with one another. So basically, you know, one day they're able to talk to one another, and then all of a sudden the next day they have no clue what each other are saying. That's where the different languages came from. And they've imagined to do this, but what I want you to keep in mind here is it says nothing will be restrained from them. You see, if people imagine wickedness in their mind and heart, it means they actually want to do it, okay? And God says they're actually going to be able to do that. Nothing's going to be restrained from them. Now turn to Romans 1. Romans 1. This kind of reminds me of when I lived in Sacramento, California, and I think most people are probably aware of this, maybe not everyone, but you know, our church was you know, on the news because you know, our pastor preached against the LGBT. And, you know, 
our, our uh, the owners of the building, they were on the side of the LGBT. They donated to the LGBT every year. So they basically let them protest right outside our building. And you know, there was that one big Sunday, there was like 500, 500 bakla at Tomboy that were just like right outside of our building. <laughs> And there was a lot fewer of us. You know, we had a lot of people come in for the event and everything like that, but there, were, there was a ton of them. And you know what? Here's, here's what I realized, and, and I should have known this, and I guess I kind of did, but I didn't think about it. And you can see this when you read Genesis 19, which we're not going to go there. But basically, I was like, you know what? What these people would actually like to do to us, they would do it if they could get away with it. See, if they imagine it, nothing's going to be restrained from them. And we know what's in their minds and in their heart. They actually wanted to harm us. You see stories in the Bible. If they could actually have gotten away with it, they would have done it. I actually went up to a policeman during that because they had like 40 policemen all in the front of the building where nothing was happening. They didn't try to help us at all. And a lot of them had like rainbow color brace, you know, <laughs> arm bracelets and things like that. On. But I asked a policeman, I said, look, I was like, there's hundreds of them here. And our people are coming in from here. And we have people visiting and stuff like that. I was like, couldn't you have like one policeman out there? I was like, you know, they could do whatever to us. And then the policeman told me, he's like, well, you need, you, you need to t start telling your people to come through this entrance. It's like, I don't even know the phone numbers of these people that are visiting. It was ridiculous, you know, just making an excuse. But it's like, you know what? They would have done whatever they could if they could have gotten away with it. Why? Nothing's going to be restrained from them if they imagine it. If they imagine it, it means they actually want to do it. That's the truth. And in Romans 1, we'll look at this. Let me, let me be honest with you. If you're visiting for the first time, this is going to be the hardest sermon I've ever preached because we're talking about what, why God destroyed the world, okay? It's kind of hard to preach a sermon of why God chose to destroy the world without preaching hard against sin, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of Baptist churches that would preach a sermon on Noah's flood and, you know, it would, it would be, you know, all nice and cuddly or whatever. But if you're going to actually preach on why God destroyed the world, obviously, you know what, it, it, the sin was pretty grievous. Even though he's being discreet, the sin was obviously really wicked, okay? And so Romans 1, remember the wording we looked at, imagine, imagine. Notice what it says in Romans 1, 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now this is really the start of the downward spiral, because this is the chapter that's talking about manga bakla tomboy, right? right. Mm -hmm. And this is the start of it, and he says vain imaginations, okay? Now remember in Romans 6, it, it said every imagination. Do you see a difference there? In Romans 6, it says every imagination, okay? Here it starts with vain imagination. See, it starts small, and it gets worse and worse. Then you get down to verse number 28, and it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 29, Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, Maliciousness, full of envy, murder, deba debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Now, I'm not going to do this for sake of time in this sermon, but if you were to really just stop in your free time and look at every statement that's being made, you think of unmerciful, you know, I don't even want to think what that means when it's talking about, you know, the sodomites and we know the things that they do and what they imagine. It's really wicked, okay? But see, this is every imagination. Their minds are defiled. See, that's what it said in Romans 6. Now, I do believe that due to the influence of Maraming Bakla in, in the world, it probably influenced, you know, everybody else. Look at, look at the world today. We're influenced by the LGBT. Is that not true? The vast majority of people in this country would say that they support them getting married. That's the truth. And they see nothing wrong with it. They become desensitized. They think it's normal to see a guy wearing a dress. Look, that's not normal. It's never going to be normal. It doesn't matter if it's common. It's not normal. You understand the difference? Just because a lot of people are doing it, that doesn't make it normal. Okay? And so... I do believe that due to the influence, other people were affected, but there was definitely a lot of people whose minds were defiled, as the Bible says. Why? Because it talks about every imagination of the thoughts of his heart. Okay? So when you really stop to think about what is he saying, he's saying they're reprobate. Yeah. He doesn't go into detail because obviously we don't really need to know the graphic description of why he destroyed the world. We know enough. Okay? Now turn to Titus 1. Titus 1. Now, 
if you stop to think about it, why would God destroy the world? Obviously, that would be common sense. That would be one of the big reasons why. Because, you know, you look at the world today. 20 years ago, this wasn't really that big of an issue in our country. But it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Same thing in the United States. It's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's going to be like the days of Noah when Jesus ends up pouring out his wrath. You know, when he raptures everyone, pours out his wrath, you know, after the tribulation, it's going to be like the days of Noah. It's going to be very similar. So it makes sense that during that time period, there's a lot of people that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Okay. Notice what it says in Titus 1, verses 15 and 16. It says, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. You say, what does that mean when it says, unto the pure, all things are pure? It means to you that are saved and living godly, when you see a, a child, like a baby, you think innocent thoughts like, you know, how cute that baby is, right? That's what a normal person would think. That's what you think. That's what I think. That's not what everybody thinks, though. Because the Bible says there's people who their mind and conscience is defiled. See, the normal thing would be looking at that child and think how cute, how innocent, you just want to hold the baby, you know, the, the baby's smiling. That's what a normal person would think, completely pure thoughts. It's hard for us to imagine someone thinking something differently. You say, why? Because our minds are not defiled. It's really hard for me to imagine. It's, it's like, how in the world could you think such impure thoughts? But here's what you have to understand. If people are willing to be pedophiles, obviously it came into their mind first. Right. When we're talking about wicked imaginations, it's not like they just became a pedophile one day. It started in the mind. And then it actually took place, okay? Yeah, right. Everything starts in the mind. Before a guy commits adultery on his spouse, guess what? He thought about committing adultery first. Yeah. That's why us as believers, if our mind starts thinking wrong thoughts, you need to cut that off there. Yeah. Right. Because before you know it, you might actually be committing adultery on your spouse. See, I would never do that. Look, if you'd be willing to think about it, then maybe you would be willing to do it under certain circumstances. Don't even allow these thoughts to enter your mind. Now, obviously, we're talking about people that every imagination is wicked and evil. That's not people that are saved. But look, the Bible does talk really against having impure thoughts. Okay, The thought of foolishness is sin. And, you know, we allow our minds to think really stupid things. And I'll tell you what, that's the reason why things take place. Because we allow it to enter into our mind. It enters into our heart. And all of a sudden, we end up changing you know, who we are. We're willing to do things that we wouldn't normally be willing to do. And so what ended up taking place in Genesis 6, well, there's a lot of people that every imagination is defiled, and then everybody else allowed their mind to wander. They got affected by these people, and then they became worse people as well. It says in verse number 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Now, some people would take this verse and try to apply work salvation to this. They say, well, if you're really saved, you're going to have a change. And because of the fact their works are wrong, that's why God says they're unsaved. No, there's, there's just certain works and certain things that no normal person would do. Right? Yep. Right. Whether they're saved or just an unbeliever, no normal person would do that. We're talking about you know defiling a child. A normal person's not going to do that. Okay. Yep. There's certain actions that if somebody were to do that, you'd say, wow, you know, they're a reprobate. Look at the Catholic priests. That's not normal, what they do. What 100% of them do. You know, I, I appreciate President Duterte saying around 90%, but it's like, you know, you underestimated a tad bit, right? But it's just like what they're willing to do, that's not normal. That's perverted. That is sick. And that's not something a normal person is going to do. So there's certain works where if you look to that, you say, wow, that guy is a child of the devil. Because no normal person would even have that come into their mind. Now turn back to Genesis chapter 6. And so the first reason why I flooded the world, the first thing mentioned in Genesis 6, was it says wicked imaginations. But I want you to notice what it says in Genesis 6, verses 11 and 12, where the Bible reads, or verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Notice how three times in those verses he mentions corrupt. Okay? Obviously... Whatever he's talking about is pretty bad. Now, we can look at these terms and just kind of have a vague understanding. We know what the word corrupt means, but it's important when you see words like this pop up that you cross-reference throughout the Bible so you very specifically understand what he's talking about. 
okay? Now, corrupt basically means filthiness, okay? Now, this filthiness could be spiritual or physical filthiness, and we're going to see how these are kind of merged together. But basically, corrupt, and we're going to look at a verse later on that shows that's what it means. But corrupt is basically referring to filthiness, okay? Now, let's look at a few verses here. Look at Exodus 8, Exodus 8. And we're going to see how this refers to filthiness. And in Exodus chapter 8, notice what it says in verse 24. This is during the plagues being poured out. And in verse 24, the Bible reads, And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, and into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. Now, what does it mean by the land was corrupted? The land was basically filthy. Look, if you had a thousand flies running around in your house, that's filthy. That's not healthy. That's not sanitary. They carry a lot of diseases. And having all those flies, it's corruption. It's filthiness. It's physical filthiness. People get diseases from them. It's not sanitary at all. Turn to Leviticus chapter 22. Leviticus 22. You know, in some countries that are, are you know, less, you know, civilized, or they're not really applying what the Bible says in the book of Leviticus, there's a lot of countries in Africa, and one reason why they die at such a young age is because there's a lot of flies that will carry diseases because basically they don't have the proper system to discard of waste. And those flies will go on the waste, and then they'll go on their food, and then they're eating food. That I mean, that's corruption. That's filthiness. It's going to cause diseases. See, I mean, the book of Leviticus is not the most exciting book in the Bible, but, you know, every country really ought to study that book and start applying. Our country needs to apply that. So they can be more sanitary and less filthy because it's not healthy on your body. In Leviticus 22, verse 25, it says, Neither from a stranger's hand shall ye offer the bread of your God of any of these, because their corruption is in them and blemishes be in them. They shall not be accepted for you. Blemishes or wounds, these things, they're not healthy. Okay, like if you have, if you have a pimple on your face, look, that's not the most cleanest sanitary thing. Okay? It's not. And when you have blemishes or you have wounds, this stuff is, is not healthy to be around. Now, obviously, all of us get hurt and various things happen, but look, if somebody has a wound on their arm, it's not smart to just go and touch that wound and just get blood of yourself. It's not healthy. And so what it's saying in Leviticus 22 is a blemish that's, that's not sanitary. It's filthy. That's what it means by corruption. It's filthy. Turn to Psalms 38. Psalms 38. And in Psalms chapter 38, Psalms is just in the middle of your Bible. Psalms 38 verse 5, the Bible reads, My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. <laughs> the wounds stink that shows that there's something wrong. And they're being, they, it says they're corrupt. Look, they're, they're basically filthy. That's what he's saying. It's not sanitary. It's not clean. Turn to Malachi 2, the last book of the Old Testament. The last book of the Old Testament. We'll make applications here in a second. But in Malachi chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. So when it talks about corrupting your seed, he says, I'm going to spread dung upon your faces. Okay? You know, that, that's referring to tithe. Okay? That's not clean. That's filthy. There's, there's no word I can use that, I mean, you, that's what it says, right? That's what the Bible is saying. And so look, when, when, when God says that he destroyed the world due to corruption, there's two aspects to this. One of them is spiritual corruption. We're going to look at that. But it was also physical corruption. It was a dirty, disgusting place. Right, right. That's the truth. You look up this word corrupt, and you say, why would it be a dirty place? Look, if people are spiritually corrupt, it's, they're going to become physically corrupt as well. Yeah, and we're going to look at sins here in a second. Sin is physically corruption. It's filthiness. Sin is. It's not healthy. It's not clean. It's not sanitary. So when it talks about corruption, there's kind of two aspects to it. Yes, they were spiritually corrupt. They were also physically corrupt as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, we're going to go soul winning in Resolve Park. Is Resolve Park the cleanest place to be? No. No, you got to watch where you're stepping. Look, that's not normal. That's not a good thing. This is, I, I, I say this description, like Manila is the San Francisco of the Philippines. That's not a compliment. I know a lot of people love San Francisco. It's a really expensive place to live, just like Manila is compared to other parts of the Philippines. But, you know, it's not the, it's not the cleanest place. It's the same sort of thing. And if you, you go out there, you have to watch where you step. 
Look, when you breathe that stuff in, it's not good. You know, I often go for walks in the morning. I do Bible memorization and prayer and stuff. And where I walk, there's certain parts where the smell is just putrid. It's, it's disgusting. That is not healthy on your body. It's not physically healthy. And if you're around that all the time, you can get sick as a result of those things. When I first moved here, I was getting sick every single week. Why? Because this area of the Philippines, this, this is the last week we're here. Praise the Lord. God bless us with the building. Right? But, you know, Manila is not a sanitary or clean place. It is a filthy place. That's just the truth. Now, praise the Lord we've won so many people to the Lord, but that is not the cleanest place to be. It's not. It's not the nicest area to live in the Philippines, at least in my opinion. I know there's a lot of activities to do. It's like, okay, I'll come in and go to those activities, you know, the Mall of Asia, you know, Ocean's, what is it, Ocean Park. But, you know, I, I don't want to live here. Because when we first moved here, we didn't know where we were going to live. We don't live here. We live in Quezon City, which is a lot where we live. It's a lot cleaner than here. Why? That stuff's not good for your body. When it talks about corruption, it's both literal and figurative there. It is talking about the world was physically just corrupt. Because look at the most disgusting, sinful places on the planet. San Francisco. That is the least clean place pretty much in, in, in the United States of America. You literally have to watch that you don't step on drug needles in certain areas. Because there's a ton of homeless people. And being homeless in, the, in America is different than homeless in the Philippines. If you are homeless in America, you are a lazy drug addict. There is no exception to that. There's a lot of people that live here that are poor. In America, if you are homeless, you are a lazy drug addict. Why? Because you don't have to work and the government will give you money to do nothing. That's the truth. And so you're choosing to live that filthy and wicked lifestyle. And look, we, we, Verity Baptist Church is right near where a lot of homeless people are. And look, we've tried giving the gospel to them. And, you know, the odds of them getting saved are like one in, in a thousand. You know, their minds are gone due to drugs and things like that. It's different. Here you can get people saved that are homeless. In America, I mean, it's pretty much impossible. Just about impossible. And most of them, honestly, you know, I believe are reprobates. You know, the lifestyle they live, they've turned against God a long time ago. They choose to live a filthy lifestyle. Turn to Acts 2. Acts 2. But you look at places like that, San Francisco, and, you know, Pastor Anderson, if you heard his sermon, he preached on San Francisco, and just physically it's not clean. You know, he just talked about the amount of, you know, tie that was all over San Francisco. I, I can't really use any other word. I mean, it just, it just is what it is. He talked about it in the sermon. It was just disgusting. And you got to watch where you step so you don't step on drug needles. Is that really what, where you want to raise your kids? And obviously, it's the biggest place, I think, in the world percentage-wise for Bakla Tomboy. The biggest place in the world percentage-wise. You think that's a clean place? No. No, it's not. So you look at areas that are really sinful, they're also really physically unclean. Because if people choose to be spiritually unclean, it's not unusual to them to be physically unclean. You see the link there? Yep. When people are just spiritually unclean, they're usually physically unclean. Knock on the doors of people that are drunks. And their house is a mess. And it smells like basura. That's the truth. You knock on those doors. And look, these young kids that go soul winning, they don't need to be taught about how bad smoking and alcohol is. Because when they go door to door, they're going to figure it out for themselves. Yep, right. Because those houses are a mess. There's really no exception to that. The people that are drunks, their house is just garbage. They don't even take care of it. Why? Because if you're spiritually unclean, you're going to be physically unclean as well. Yep. In Acts 2 verse 31, we'll look at one of the verses that shows... This is talking about what corruption is talking about. Verse 31, he seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. The reason why it says his flesh didn't see corruption is he physically rose again before his body really started to decompose. Because yeah. Lazarus was dead, Lazarus was dead for four days, and behold, he stinketh. Yeah. The body of Jesus did not stink. Why? He rose again before four days. He rose again at three days. That's why Jesus waited to resurrect Lazarus. Because he was trying to make it a, a point to everyone, he's dead. So no one could doubt the miracle. But Jesus rose again before his flesh could actually see corruption. Okay? Now, turn to Revelation 17. Revelation 17. And we're going to look at the spiritual aspect of this as well. And we're going to look at a, a couple verses here that, that prove corruption is talking about filthiness. But it says in Revelation 17, verse 4, 
And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with golden precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. Okay, now turn to Revelation 19. And in Revelation 17, it says filthiness of her fornication. But notice Revelation 19, verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the, avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. So in Revelation 17, it says the filthiness of her fornication. In Revelation 19, it talks about the corruption as a result of her fornication. So when the Bible is saying that it was corrupt, it's saying it was filthy. Okay. Now, fornication is obviously spiritually sinful. It's obviously spiritually unclean. It's also physically unclean as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right. God designed you to marry one person and to be with one person. It is not healthy to just be a whore or a whoremonger. <laughs> God uses those words. He uses words like whore, whoremonger, harlot. When you're talking about something that's really wicked, you need to use really strong words to describe it. Yeah, Why? Because right. we don't want the kids in this room to grow up and be whores and harlots no, no. and whoremongers. Amen. That's the truth. Yeah. And this is for both men and women. No. Fornication is not physically clean. It's not healthy on your body. How many people are running around there with STDs? Why? Because they're going around as whores and whoremongers. And that's what the result is. Because sin is not clean. It's physically. There's built-in consequences to sin. That's the truth of it. Fornication and adultery and these things, it's not even healthy on your body. Much less the judgment that comes from God for your sin. It's not even healthy on your body. You can get STDs. You can die at young ages. I mean, the Bible talks about the, the wicked living out half their days. Look at the average lifespan of a bakla. It's not very long. Yeah. Right. You say, why? Because they live a physically filthy lifestyle that has built-in consequences for their actions. Mm -hmm. In America, there's the big thing where everyone was dying from AIDS. Hey, that's their choice that they made to live that lifestyle. Amen. Right. And you know what? There's built-in consequences. It's physically unclean. And look, you know, in our room, hey, don't go around and be a whore or whoremonger. Find one person you want to marry, someone who's saved and loves the Lord, get married to them, and don't be with anyone else your whole life. That is what God's plan is. Amen. And look, you know what? It, it's worth the wait. You know, I got married when I was 30 years old. I wasn't young. I waited for the right person, okay? I didn't jump into it because obviously marriage is a big decision you make, okay? It's, it's a permanent thing. I know some people maybe, you know, some people maybe they, they jump in more so, but obviously people can make their decisions. But for me, I was like, you know, I want to wait and make sure I have the right person. And I got married when I was 30 years old. But, you know, I kept myself pure before I got married as well. I didn't go around as a whore or whoremonger, I should say, just with all kinds of different women. And look, you know, one, one problem in our country, the truth is that trafficking and, you know, people being with young girls is a big problem in our country. Is that not true? I mean, it, it's true. My wife is from Annalee City. I, I've been to Annalee City. I love that area. But you know what? If you ever type that in, don't type it in on YouTube because you know what? You're just going to see a bunch of perversion that pops up. Don't type that into Google Images because you're going to see perversion that pops up. Why? Because that's kind of a hub for a lot of this place. There's that area there that's really wicked that nobody ought to go to. Right. That's yeah. the truth. Yeah. And in Manila, look, it's the same case. I mean, you, you can walk around and just, you know, see so many people here that you know are here just for perversion and wickedness. And many of them are reprobates. That's the truth. People come here from the U.S., the U.K., Australia. They come from these places to fulfill their lustful, sick desires. They come here. They come to Thailand some of these places. And look, we don't want it in our country. That's why we got to preach against it, because it's embarrassing that that takes place in this country. Yeah, but that is the truth that fornication and adultery, it runs rampant here, and people come here for that. That's the truth. It's sick. It's perverted. And you know what? We should have nothing to do with it whatsoever. Turn to Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28. And so you look at a place like Manila that is spiritually wicked due to all the trafficking and things like that, and guess what? It's also physically, you know, unclean as well. It's spiritually unclean, and guess what? It gets passed on to being physically unclean. That's why it's physically unclean. You know, if there were churches that were in Manila that were preaching hard against sin, and, you know, you didn't have to drive, you know, two hours to come to this church, look, this place would be different. 
It would clean up the problems here if there was other churches doing the same thing we are. And you know, there are a few churches here and there that are within a decent distance of us. You know, pastors that I know, and I'm glad for the work they're doing. They're going so many. But you know what? It's few. It's not that many. There's 13 people here, million people here in Metro Manila. That's a lot of people to reach. And you don't hear the Baptist churches <laughs> crying against sin like they ought to be, like the Bible commands them to do. Yep. Fornication is physical corruption. It's physically unclean. Look at, look at Isaiah 28. Let's look at drinking. Isaiah 28, verses 7 and 8. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink and are, and are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Well, that really makes you want to drink alcohol, doesn't it? They err in vision. They can't see. They stumble in judgment. Is that really what you want to be like? Look, I, I, I'm, I'm literally physically blind without confidence. Like, I can't see anything. I don't think you want my eyesight. But that's them just drunk. They're just stumbling around. You know, that's the way the Bible describes them. They can't really see. They stumble around. That's, that's the way drunk people are. Yep. But notice what it says in verse 8. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Corruption. Filthiness. Is vomit the cleanest thing that you know? No. It's disgusting, isn't it? Right. I, it's, yeah. not, it's not fun to preach on. Like, I don't like preaching against this stuff. You know, if you're going to preach the whole Bible, you have to preach against this stuff. Like I said, this is really the biggest sermon I've preached against sin. This is talking about the destruction of the world, so you have to be that way. It's not fun to talk about vomit. It's disgusting. But, you know, people get drunk, and they wake up in their own vomit, and they seek it yet again. It's like, what in the world is wrong with them? Now, that is spiritually unclean, because it's wrong to drink alcohol. But is that physically clean? No, it's not. It's physically, it's physical corruption. And so the world was in a place of not only spiritual wickedness, it was also physically unclean. That's why he uses the word corruption, because corrupt can mean multiple things in the Bible. The Bible talks about let no corruption proceed out of your mouth, no, no corrupt words proceed out of your mouth. It's talking about filthy communication, filthy words. You know, we ought to obviously speak differently than the world. So when it says corrupt, it uses that word because it's a broad term that can both mean physical and spiritual. He's highlighting the fact it wasn't just spiritually wicked, it was physically a disgusting place to be. It was like Manila. It was like San Francisco. It was physical corruption everywhere. I'm sure there was vomit all over the place. Is that really where you want to go? You know, I, I went to college, and I, I know people have different opinions in college. I got saved in college, so obviously I'm in a different situation than a lot of people that, that maybe got saved before college. I got saved in college, and look, WVU where I went, West Virginia University, every year is voted the number one drinking school in the nation. Wow. They have an award with, with Playboy magazine, and a lot of people in West Virginia are real proud of it. It's like, wow, how exciting. You went to the biggest drinking school in the nation. Congratulations. That's just great. And so look, when you walk around for class, guess what? There's dry puke on the ground. You, you, want, you want to live that sort of lifestyle? You walk out of your house, you got to watch where you step. Your, your son or your daughter goes out to play, and then you got to clean them all the time because they've, they've stepped in vomit. That's the way the world was before the flood. You say, how do you know that? Because it says it was corrupt. And when you look up, and it highlights corrupt three times. Obviously, we know it's spiritually corrupt, but I want to highlight this because I, I don't think, even myself, I didn't really think about what the world was like before the flood. But when you look at what the Bible's saying, it was also physically an un, a filthy place. It was not a clean place. It was corrupt both spiritually and physically. It was disgusting. It's not even fun to think about. This sort of lifestyle of drinking alcohol, doing drugs, smoking cigarettes, it's not only spiritually a sin, it's also physically a, a filthy lifestyle why people smoke a cigarette for the first time i've never smoked a cigarette but people smoke a cigarette for the first time they always cough cough don't they yeah they always sound like they're about to die do you really think that's what god wants you to ingest inside your body i mean obviously there's consequences to doing that just you know there's building consequences it's just physically though unclean and i don't like being around where people are smoking you know i remember we went to, we were in a gypsy one time it, it's illegal to smoke in gypsies right for the rider driver and i remember we were in one and the driver was smoking a cigarette and i was ticked because my son is like you know 10 months old or 11 months old or however when we were in there and he was doing it and you know i'm glad you know my wife stepped up and told him you know hey you need to put that out because i don't want my son ingesting smoke when he's 10 months old that's not healthy on his body yep. and you know what that's that's people don't see anything wrong with it though why because they're spiritually sinful it ends up becoming them physically being unclean as well and they see nothing wrong with it. Look, you know, we, we, we want to be around places that are clean. I, I hate filth. It's disgusting. 
And you know what? If, if you're godly, you're not going to want to be around filth all the time either. Yeah. Yeah. And so turn back to Genesis 6. I'll tell you one problem with guys in our movement, and I, I hope it's not the way, I, I hope it's not with our church. You know, I, I don't really necessarily know, but it is in America. Guys that are single and unmarried, they just don't have good hygiene. That's the truth. It's like, you know, you can smell them from a distance. And it's like, what are you doing? Because before I was married, you know, I, there, there's this invention called a shower. And you know what? I like that invention. <laughs> and there's this thing called a toothbrush where you, you know, brush your teeth. And it's like, you know, honestly, you know, we as God's people, I do believe we ought to take care of ourselves physically. Oh, yes. You know, you shouldn't just have a bunch of dirty laundry around all over the floor. No, you should, you should keep your house clean and keep your bodies clean. It's not good to be around that. It's not healthy on your body. That will cut off your lifespan, honestly, when you're around that stuff. That's why people that live spiritually, you know, sinful lives, they die at young ages oftentimes because of the choices that they make. And so another thing that's mentioned in Genesis chapter 6, verse 11, it says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So the first thing we saw was wicked imaginations, and we talked about what exactly that meant. Then we talked about just corruption, which is both filthy spiritually and physically. Then it says the earth was filled with violence. Okay, what is violence? It's talking about physical harm, which often includes murder. Okay, it says the earth was filled with violence, with murder. Okay, it was common that people were being murdered. Turn to Matthew 2. Matthew 2. Now, this isn't really the point of my sermon, but let me just say this, that I think we prove that God doesn't like you to be some, around things that are unclean. That's not good for you, right? Yeah. And I, let me just mention this, because obviously this is a big issue. We're going to talk about this in Matthew 2 here. But let me tell you something that's not clean. Vaccinations are not clean. Amen. Right. Amen. They're not clean. Amen. My son wasn't vaccinated. I made it a point to make sure that he wasn't vaccinated. That's not clean. God is against corruption and uncleanness. It's not healthy on your body. Look. When I was young, the amount, and I was vaccinated when I was a kid, right? Obviously, when you're a kid, you know, people make choices and everything. But look, it was a lot <laughs> different back then, though. Back then, you got vaccinated for a few things. Now, they just multiply that by, like, 20. You get vaccinated for every, vaccination for chicken pox. It's like, are you kidding me? I mean, every kid just, you know, I got chicken pox when I was a kid. You get it, you get over it. No big deal. And you get vaccinated for everything in today's world. And they want to scare you into thinking that you have to get vaccinated for everything. Well, here's my problem with it. It's not clean. Yep. Okay. And God's against things that are filthy. Look, it's not clean by their own definition. And if you listen to the people that are the big rich people, they don't vaccinate their kids. Yeah, right. Say why? Because they know it's not safe. No. They know it's not clean. I mean, they'll, they'll tell you, you got to vaccinate your kid. They don't vaccinate their kids. I mean, those guys like Bill Gates and those rich people, I wonder why that is. That they won't vaccinate their kid, but they really want you to vaccinate your kid. That's interesting. Yep. <laughs> Look at Matthew 2. We're talking about violence, and it says in Matthew 2, verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, and was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. Can you imagine the mind of someone that would be willing to kill every single baby under the age of two? That's a wicked person. Yep, right. That's someone whose mind is defiled. That's someone who's a child of the devil. That's not a normal person. That's, that's a pretty wicked and perverted person that would be willing to do that. You know, in, in our country, you know, abortion is illegal. But you know what? I promise you there's doctors that will do things under the table. Right. Now, yeah. look, I don't think that every mom that chooses to abort her child is a reprobate. It's a, it's a really wicked sin. They're going to have to live with it. They're going to regret that. Let me tell you something. The doctors that will go against the law of the country just because they think it's so important for you to abort, being able to abort your child, that's a wicked person. That's a bad person. You know, in America... Obviously, you know, there, there's certain rules when you get visas and things like that where vaccinations are required, and it takes effort to get out of them when, if you're against them. And, and here's the thing. I'm telling you what my opinion is. I believe what, that's what the Bible teaches. Everyone here is welcome to make their own choice with their kids. 
God gave you those kids. They're not my kids. I make choices with my kids. You make choices with your kids. That's fine. But an example of what I'm talking about, though, is if you try to get out of vaccinations, you can find doctors who will sign off and say that so-and-so got a vaccination. Okay? And that's something I know a lot of people do, where they get find someone, you pay them money, and the reason why that doctor does that, it could be because they want money, but, but a big reason is probably because there's a lot of doctors that don't think it's safe, so they're willing to do that. They're willing to go against the law because they want to protect you. They don't want you to, to be harmed through a vaccination or your child. Okay? But think about a doctor that would go against the law just because he thinks it's important that you can get an abortion. That's a little bit different, isn't it? Yep. That, that, that's pretty wicked that you would, you would think it's so important that women have the right to murder their baby that you're going to go against the law and just illegally do it. That's wicked. But look, when the Bible says that violence was throughout the earth, I promise you abortion was a big part of it. Yep. You say, wait, wait, weren't they like monkey men back then? No. They, they were civilized. They were smart. They're probably a lot smarter than we are today. Okay? I promise you they developed ways to do abortions and things like that. You know, it's known in ancient Egypt, they had ways of doing birth control and abortion, all these things. Those things they figured out a long time ago. You know, wicked people will figure out what they want to do a long, I mean, they figure it out because they really want to be able to do it. I promise you abortion was a big part of that. The earth was filled with violence. Now turn to Nahum 3. Nahum 3. In America, there was something big recently that happened where, I think it's in New York, where they passed a law that you can abort your baby slightly after it's born. And I didn't really study the specifics of it, so I, I, it's possible I could misspeak, but that's what I, I heard certain people preaching about. I didn't really look into it myself. But it's like, here's the thing. you know, What I told people is this, that if you open the door with allowing abortion in some cases, that's going to be the end result. All of a sudden, you'll say, well, you know, this kid's six years old and he's got a deformity. Let's just kill him. And the world's going to think that's normal. You say, that would never happen. Yeah, it will. Yeah. There's a lot of things we never thought were going to happen that have happened. Okay? If you're, if you're willing to start aborting babies, it, it, what's funny about it is you'll go to jail if you refuse to vaccinate your kid, but you're welcome to murder your baby you know, after they're born, if they're young enough. I mean, isn't the world just so stupid? Like yeah. their logic of what they think makes sense? Talk about foolishness. That you're able to, you're as a parent are able to abort your child even after they're born now but you know they're passing laws where it's illegal not to vaccinate your child it's like if you have the right to kill your baby i mean would you have the right to to not have your child vaccinated I mean, that's ridiculous that's the way the world is i promise you abortion was a big part of it notice nahum chapter 3 verse 1 nahum chapter 3 verse 1 it says woe to the bloody city it is all full of lies and robbery the prey departeth not. Now, if you remember, Nahum is a follow-up book to the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah was about the Assyrian Empire. Now, throughout it, when it talks about the Assyrian Empire, it highlights Nineveh, Nineveh, Nineveh. Why? That was the main city in Assyria. So when he talked about Assyria, it was kind of known by Nineveh. That's the big city. So when it says, woe to the bloody city, it's not really just referring to the city itself, but the whole country. Because Assyria was the most dominant country in the world at that time. They were the world power. They're one of the most powerful countries that ever lived at their peak. And the Bible says in verse 1, Nahum chapter 3, verse 1, Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. And it says the bloody city. And so you see lies, you see robbery, and if you go, you go on, you can tell that they're, they're guilty of murdering a lot of people. They took over empires and would kill their leaders. They would torture them and things like that. It was a wicked empire. It was violence. And I promise you, that in Genesis chapter 6, when it says the earth was filled with violence, murder was a large part of that. Obviously not just murdering babies, but obviously if the earth is filled with violence, you know, robbery and all these things were all taking place. The earth was a very violent place. Turn to Psalms 59. Psalms 59. Now, our country, you know, isn't really a country that goes around and starts war with all these countries. But I'll tell you what, the United States, the world power today, they go around and start wars with everybody. You say, well, how does God think about it? Woe to the bloody city. That's what he thinks about. It. That you go around and start wars with all these countries for what purpose? For oil? Is that your purpose? I mean, you don't want to admit that, but that's obviously your purpose a lot of times. Woe to the bloody city. That's what God thinks about. It. Yep. When you go around and you just kill innocent people. Look, a child, I don't care where they are, a young child that's one or two years old 
what would give you the right to just kill that child because he's born in a certain country? I mean, that's wicked. And, you know, I know people that were in the military in the U.S., and they admitted that this stuff took place, where there were guys that thought it was just a big joke, where they would just almost play a game with these people that they were killing and just kind of shoot at them, just like a cat would play with its prey, right? The cat will just play around with it, the mouse before it kills it. That's the way that some people were, and then they would just gun down innocent women and children. I know people that have seen it happen. It's not just you see it on YouTube. It's like, that's wicked. And you know what? To God, that's wicked. He says, woe to the bloody city. That's, that's way past saying, well, that was in war, so it's okay. That's wicked to do something like that. Mm-hmm. Psalms 59, verses 1 and 3. Deliver me from mine enemies, O my God. Defend me from them that rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloody men. The workers of iniquity are people that are, are false prophets, really wicked people, reprobates. And what, what a shock. They're also bloody men according to the Bible. They're also willing to commit murder. Why? Because their mind and conscience is defiled. They're filled with all this wickedness. Verse 3, For lo, they wait and they lie in wait for my soul. The mighty are gathered against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. You know, there are people that want to destroy us. They want to kill us. Obviously, David was a righteous person. He was a good man who led many people to the Lord. There are people that are just bad people, and they hate us. That's the truth. We're going to battle. You say, well, well, how do you battle against these people? You, as Pastor Amina said just a couple weeks ago, you don't battle it on social media. That's not the way you battle. Why? You'll lose that battle. Right. You'll, you'll end up getting sued, and you'll lose the case because they'll pay off the judge. That's what will happen in the Philippines. Right. Yeah. And look, I, I learned that very early on. When I first came here, I preached just like I would preach in America. And if you remember, not everyone maybe was here to hear that sermon. I preached a sermon called Hardcore versus Wise and Harmless. Okay? I, I learned something new from the Bible because I saw the situation we were in. I was like, whoa, you know, I preach like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be six feet under in no time. You know, I realized, you know what? The way we're going to fight against these false prophets is get many people saved, get churches started, Amen. build people up, help them grow. It's not going to be by naming out and calling out every false prophet because those false prophets are more powerful than us. And you know what? They will pay off the judges. They will sue you. And you know what? It's not a big deal. 4000 bucks to them, 10000 bucks, whatever it would cost. Not a big deal to them. They just want to destroy you. Look, if they're willing to kill you in Psalms 59, don't you think they'd be willing to get you thrown in jail and destroy your lives? Yeah. And look, you know, we need to apply that because honestly, that's something we're going to fight in the Philippines. And you know what? It's, it's, it's sad that this, this stuff happens, but you call it these false prophets, you can get yourself in some real trouble. And honestly, I, I'm, I'm speaking from my heart right now. I'm trying to, I, I thought about talking to my church, you know, just maybe afterwards, but we need to make sure we're careful, okay? Because unfortunately, I know some stuff that probably nobody in here knows, and everyone's going to know in a few days, and it's sad. And I don't want what's going to happen at their church to happen to ours, which means you need to be careful with what you say. Because look, you have to understand, when you say something, guess who also gets in trouble? I get in trouble, right? I mean, if, if you blast a false prophet online and get sued, I could easily get sued as well as a result of just I'm the one who's running the show here. And I am responsible. That's why I have to nip it in the bud if it's a problem. And honestly, with, with what's happened in the last week, look, you know, we need to be very careful with what we say and not say anything because we could get ourselves in real trouble. And what I'm responsible for our church, and obviously churches do things differently, but you know what? We need to be careful with what we say and be smart and mature. Zeal is a great thing, but zeal can also get you into a lot of trouble as well. When I was a young Christian and newly saved and excited, and I started listening to Pastor Anderson, man, I was zealous. I got a lot of people saved. I also got myself into a lot of trouble, right? Because I, I, was, I was zealous. I was just like a lot of people in this room, and that, that just takes time. It takes, unfortunately, the way it goes is zeal comes before maybe more maturity and charity and knowledge and some of these other things. But honestly, it's like, you know, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. And look, in a, in, in a few days, you, you all are going to know what I'm talking about. And that's sad. I don't want it to happen at this church, which means we need to be careful with what we do and what we say. And I'm going to be careful with what I say. I'm preaching a hard sermon now, but honestly, there's some things I intentionally am not going to say. There, there are sermons that I will preach where we will not have it on live stream because if I put it on live stream, I will get sued. I will get in trouble because there's certain false prophets that I feel I need to preach against because they're big in the Philippines. But you know what? It's not smart to just broadcast it to everyone. Right. You gotta yeah. be smart. Yes, it's good to be bold and preach the truth. We gotta be careful though with how we do it though. 
because you have to understand your battlefield. In this battlefield, you will get sued very quickly. In America, you never really get sued, and they're never going to win that case. And here, you'll get sued quickly if you're lucky. If you're not lucky, they'll pay someone to kill you. Yep. That's, true. That's, that's the truth. Yeah. And look, that's, that's something I've learned. And look, we need to pass it on to all of us. We need to be zealous for what's good. We need to be careful. And look, you know, you guys will know what I'm saying in a few days. And, and it's sad, but it is what it is. And we need, to, we need to learn from situations like that. So in Genesis 6, you don't have to turn back there. We're pretty much done. But the three points we saw were that, you know what, the earth was was filled with wicked imaginations, which includes having a ton of people that were bakla, a tomboy. And it was also a very violent place. And it was also a corrupt place, a filthy place, both physically and spiritually. Both those things. It was a wicked place. God chose to destroy the world. Okay? Our world is on a downward spiral. There is no way it's going to end up coming back up. You say, well, how do you know that? The reason why I know that is because in today's world, because remember in Genesis 11, it talked about that they're all able to communicate with one another and now nothing's going to be restrained from them. We live in a day where communication is pretty easy, right? You can communicate with people all over the world. And look, even if you don't speak their language, Google Translate does, does not do a bad job of, of helping you out with what they're saying. It's not perfect, but the technology is getting better and better. So they're able to communicate very easily with one another. With the rise of the internet and the television and the smartphones, there's no way this world's coming back. It is a downward spiral until it's destroyed. So what can we do about it? We need to just get as many people saved as we can yep. Yep. while we have time. That is all we can do about it. We're not going to change this world. But you know what I would like to see happen in the Philippines over these next several years is that we work hard at getting churches started. Obviously, we get lots of people saved here. We do what we can to bring people to this church. We get churches started. And, you know, we can at least spare God's judgment on this country for a while. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. right. We need to do what we can to fix this place. Because, look, there's a, there's a lot of problems. I preach against the U.S. a lot because the U.S. is a good example of, of wickedness. They're the, the, the biggest, most powerful country in the world. we got a lot of problems in our country. we got a lot of things that need to be fixed. And quite honestly, over the last several years, things are getting worse in this country in terms of sin and what's allowed. It's right. getting worse. Yeah, the right. only way to yeah. fix it is if we preach hard behind the pulpit and fix this situation. That's all we can do. Amen. Amen. You know, a long time ago when there was the Battle of Mactan with Ferdinand Magellan, Lapu Lapu, <laughs> you know, the I, I've always been interested in this when I first started studying, you know, stuff on the Philippines. And when you think about it, with Ferdinand Magellan and the Catholic Church coming over here and basically forcing people to become Catholic, look, he was a bad guy. That's wrong to do that. Just come in and say, we're going to take over. Okay? And he got killed. He didn't travel around the world. They teach you in America, maybe they do here, that he traveled around the world. Ferdinand Magellan did not travel around the world. He was yeah. killed in the Philippines. But his men came back and took over. I think what he did is wicked and evil, but you know, honestly, God used it for good. You know why? This is a Catholic country. That's really good for us. Because if it was not a Catholic country, this would not be a place where soul winning would be great. I mean, honestly, it's great what happened. God used it for good. Look, we live in, in perhaps the most receptive country in the world. That's what we should focus on. We should be thankful for that. You know, a lot of people want to live other places and they say, well, I wish I lived here. Lots of people here would just love to move to America. But look, you know, man, you ought to realize how big of a blessing it is that we can go out soul winning for a couple hours and you're guaranteed you're going to get somebody saved. Yeah. It's not like that in most parts of the world. It's amazing. Like, I, I've had times where I went soul winning like 14 or 15 straight hours with zero saved in California. Do you know how frustrating it is to go soul winning for that many hours and nobody gets saved? I remember one time I went through a spell where, you know, nobody even wanted to really listen. And then I'd get people to listen, but then they never end up getting saved at the end. And I was like, oh, this is so frustrating. I was excited. I got to the end and they're like, yeah, I'm not sure if I believe that or not. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. But look, you're never going to go 14 hours without somebody saved here unless you just don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Which obviously we start, we're new, but you know, at our church, you can come out soul winning with us on Sunday afternoon, you can come out soul winning on Saturday, we can show you how it's done, we can get people saved, and look, we can do what we can to spare God's judgment on this country. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here today, and I just ask you to help us apply this sermon to our lives, God. Help 